When you meditate, you're taking responsibility for your mind. The thoughts that you're going to act on, the thoughts you're going to focus on, how you focus on them, with what purpose. You're being responsible because you realize that your actions will have an important impact now and on into the future. So we're to make sure that the impact is good so that you will experience happiness now and into the future. So you keep watch. Give the mind something good to do, one good thing to do, so it can stick with the one thing and not get too complicated. You focus on the breath. And then you try to breathe in a way that feels good. It makes it easier to stay focused. And if the breath is uncomfortable, you're going to find a lot of other things to do. But think of the breath as the whole body of energy. You breathe in, the whole body is breathing in, the whole body is breathing out. And you can breathe in a way that's tight and restricted, or you can breathe in a way that's open and more comfortable. So try to find what rhythm of breathing feels good now. They may have noticed, I say, you're doing this and you're hoping for your own happiness as a result. And you're watching over your actions. So you play a big role. The problem is sometimes when you read in the Buddhist teachings, there's a teaching on not self, anatta. And some people interpret that as meaning there is no self. And then, of course, that raises the question, well, who's meditating? Who's going to benefit? Who's watching? But it's important to understand from the very beginning that the question the Buddha was answering was not whether or not there is a self. It's whether the things that you're holding on to are worth holding on to. And the word anatta actually doesn't mean no self, it means not self. So when the mind is settled down, and you find that you're still holding on to certain ideas that are getting in the way, you can tell yourself, well, these are not me, you're not mine. Even though they appear in your mind, you don't have to take responsibility for them. You take responsibility for the things that are more skillful. So you're being selective. Then you have to reflect and think as you go through life. You're selective in this way anyhow. You've been this way all along. Suppose you're back when you were a child, and suppose that you had a little sister. And somebody down the street is beating up on your little sister. Well, you've got to go and defend her because she is your sister. So in that case, your sense of you and yours is large enough to extend to include her as well. But then you get her back home, and then she starts playing with your toys and won't let you play with them. Then your sense of you doesn't extend to include her anymore. So as we go through life, we're defining ourselves by what we want what we feel is under our control. Anything that lies beyond our control, things that we don't want to lay claim to, those are not-self. So the concept of not-self is nothing foreign. It's part of the way that we negotiate the world. So we can focus on the well-being of what we identify as really being our well-being, and whatever is going to lead to that well-being and put aside anything that's not going to be conducive to our well-being. Of course, there are a lot of things in the world that are beyond your control, which will affect your well-being. And you've got to realize that they're beyond your control. You've got to focus on the things that are, are in your control. So in this case, you use this concept of self in a skillful way as you're meditating. And that's what the practice is all about, is learning to have a skillful way of defining who you are, what you are, what's your responsibility, and what's not. And you'll find that that will change as the practice progresses. This is what the Buddha is getting at when he says, not self. There are a lot of things that we lay claim to that are actually causing us suffering. They're not total suffering, there's some pleasure there, which is why we lay claim to them. Although sometimes the pleasure that's there is simply the pleasure of habit, the things you've laid claim to in the past, you just keep laying claim to them now. But the Buddha wants you to stop and think what really is worth laying claim to. And when you think about your happiness, what really would be your happiness? So those are the kinds of questions he has you ask. What, when I do it, will lead to my long-term wealth and happiness? What, when I do it, will lead to my long-term harm and suffering? 
That's where wisdom begins, as he says. You realize that you do have to take responsibility for your happiness or suffering. And that if you're wise, it will lead to happiness for you. That there's even one passage where he talks about people laying claim to things that are beyond their control. And when they let go of those things, when they realize they're not self, then they will lead, will discover true happiness for themselves. So the concept of self plays a role in the path. You're the self who decides what you want. You will benefit from what you do. And then you're the one who, you're the self who actually does the actions. And then there's the you who watches over the actions to see if they really do get the results you want. And if they don't, make suggestions. This is the, the inner voice of the commentator. All these thing, types of self have to be trained. So that the self who wants happiness has to learn how to raise its standards. The self who's going to gain that happiness is going to have to be taught how to put forth more effort in the right areas. And the self who's a commentator has to learn how to be a skillful critic. A lot of people complain that their inner critic is very destructive. It's because it has been trained. When it is trained, it's more helpful. It realizes that its judgments are not final judgments. You don't want to come to the conclusion, well, you're a miserable person and you never get anywhere. That kind of judgment doesn't help. But the kind of judgment that says, well, you did this, but you could do that and it would be better. That's the kind of inner judge that you want. You're judging your practice as a work in progress, like a carpenter working on a chair. If you make a mistake with your saw, make a mistake with your plane, you learn how to correct. One, you notice that it was a mistake, and then two, you learn how to correct for it. You don't just give up on the chair. You figure out how to work with it so that you can come out with something that approximates what you wanted to begin with. And sometimes you find, as you're doing the work, you can come up with even better ideas. So that's the kind of inner critic you want. As for anything that doesn't help in this direction, you can say, well, that's not going to be my responsibility. I'm not going to take that on as my thought. Because thoughts will appear in the mind. Sometimes it seems like the mind is a random thought generator. It comes up with all kinds of things that are, some of which are relevant, some of which are not relevant. You have to realize you have the choice. You can identify with some of the thoughts and not with others. So how do you judge? We look at where the thoughts are coming from. If they come from greed, aversion, and delusion, you can tell yourself, if I act on these ideas, if I follow through with them, it's going to cause trouble. I don't want that. So I can say no to those thoughts. As for thoughts that will lead to true happiness, you want to identify with them. So when you find a struggle inside as to what to do, ask yourself, well, which voice is coming from where and where is it going to lead? And if you're wise, you'll Identify with the wiser voice and let the other ones go. That's where you get used to seeing things as not-self, that you've chosen to lay claim to things that weren't worth, worth laying claim to. Because that's basically what, what the concept of not-self comes down to. It's a value judgment. Is this worth it? If I lay claim to this, say, this is me, this is mine, where is it going to take me? Are the, the efforts that go into maintaining this going to be worth it or not? And sometimes the answer is yes, they are worth it. As you're working on the path, that's going to be a path that requires a lot of effort. But you see that it's going to lead to a good result down the end of the road. So you stick with it. You put up with whatever difficulties are there because you see they're going to be more than repaid. But there are a lot of other things in life that you lay claim to and they don't really repay you. You go back over them again and again and again, like a dog worrying a bone. There's no meat there, but something about that bone has this dog obsessed. Thinking maybe the next time I chew on it, maybe it'll get some flavor. But it doesn't have any real nourishment for you at all. So when you can see that happening, 
and you've got something better inside, then you can let go. This is why we develop concentration, to give you something better to hold on to. So right now, while you're here meditating, any thoughts that relate to the breath, any thoughts that relate to the mind staying with the breath, yeah, those are going to be useful. You can lay claim to those. Thoughts that would pull you away, for the time being, you say, that's not me. I'm not going to go there. I'm not going to take on that identity. When you think in these ways, then you can use the concept of self in a skillful way, and you can use the concept of not-self in a skillful way, because they're both meant to be strategies. For the sake of true happiness. And ultimately, as you get further and further on the path, you find that the things that you used to hold on to that were worth holding on to at the beginning of the path may not be worth holding on to anymore. You may not need them anymore. So you let them go, let them go. And finally, you deliver to the mind to a place where it doesn't need those strategies anymore. Because both the concept of self and the concept of not self are strategies. For the sake of happiness, when you've arrived at the ultimate happiness, you don't need those strategies. So you can let both of them go. So when you understand the concept of self and the concept of not-self and how they can be used, that clears up a lot of confusion. Sometimes you hear it, especially if you've been taking a class in Buddhism. They teach you about the Four Noble Truths, they teach you about the teaching on not-self, and they teach you on karma and rebirth. And usually it's explained, well, there is no self. That's the nature of reality. But then the question is, if there is no self, who is doing the karma? Who is going to reap the results? What's going to get reborn? And you just get tied up in knots trying to answer those questions. But you put it the other way around. The Buddha's basic teaching is on action. Your intentions shape our experience of the world. So everything starts with intention. And then the question there is, with what intention are you using the concept of self, and what intention are you using the concept of not-self? In other words, instead of putting not-self as the context and karma as the problem to be fit into that context, it's the other way around. You start with karma as the context, and then you try to see what kind of action is your concept of self, what kind of action are your concepts of not-self. How can you train them so they actually are conducive to true happiness? When you get the context straight, then the questions get straight as well, and the answers get useful. So remember this. Your idea of who you are is a strategy, so learn how to use it well. Until you don't need it anymore, then you can put it aside.